What is Racism? By Alanda Benoist. Translated by Francis J. Green. Fighting racism requires knowing what it is, not an easy task. Today the word racism has so many contradictory meanings that it takes on the aura of a myth and is, therefore, difficult to define. The following will attempt to define racist ideology, independently of any sociological considerations. The first difficulty arises from the fact that racism is a simpfort, a term with pejorative connotations, whose very use inevitably tends to be more instrumental than descriptive. Deploying the adjective racist involves using a powerful epithet. It can be a smear designed to disqualify those at whom the term is addressed. To call someone a racist, even if the charge is intellectually dishonest, can be a useful tactic either in successfully paralyzing or in casting enough suspicion as to curtail's credibility. Such an approach is commonplace in everyday controversies. On the international level, the term can acquire a significance and weight that does not hide its real nature and purpose. Because of a certain affinity, racism can be used as the correlate of a whole series of other terms, fascism, the extreme right, anti-Semitism, sexism, etc. Today, the almost ritualistic recitation of these terms often implies that they are all synonyms and that anyone falling into one of these categories automatically belongs to all of them. The end result is to reinforce the vagueness of the term and to discourage meaningful analysis. Used in the most diverse senses, the terms racism and racist become prepackaged formulas, generating stereotypes. Anti-racists tend to attack racists in much the same way as racists might go after anyone else. Paradoxically, while the signifier racist is vague, the signified is rigidly fixed. The charge of having a racist temperament follows the same reasoning for which racists are rightly reproached, that is, vaguely attributing to an entire group traits found in some of its members which, as Pierre-André Taguif has pointed out, generates another problem. There is no effective struggle against racism once one creates a false image of it, for then anti-racism becomes a mirror image of the racist myth. To treat in a racist way those whom one is accusing of racist conduct is part and parcel of current anti-racism, and one of its shortcomings. Above all, to fictionalize the other, even if he be racist, is to miss who the other really is, never coming to know him. Public opinion's disapproval of racist theories and conduct itself contributes to obscuring the issue. In France, where racism is a crime and where, on the whole, it is severely sanctioned, there is a tendency to deny it, the status of an ideology or of an opinion. Furthermore, the law makes no distinction between racist theory, inciting racial hatred, and racist behavior. Under these conditions, racism has less to do with ideas than with the penal system. As for the approach which tends to define racism as an intellectual disease, an approach frequently using biological metaphors, racism becomes a leprosy, Albert Jacquard, or madness, Christian Della Campaign. This does not help matters either. Moreover, these two interpretations, as delirium and as crime, are contradictory. If racists are mad, they do not belong in court, but in asylums and, of course, a biological dimension raises the question of contagion. When all is said and done, the word race and its derivatives, racism, racist, etc., appear so emotionally charged that it has been compared to the word sex in the 19th century. Both words invite evasion or semantic substitution. Any study of racism must take all of this into consideration, even if only to avoid falling into the same trap. This is why it is advisable to follow Pierre Foggirola's advice, the social sciences must study racism as an ensemble of observable phenomena among others and in relation to other phenomena. The word racism appeared in the Lyris Dictionary for the first time in 1932. A careful examination of dictionaries since then reveals that the definitions of the term overlap, a system which affirms the superiority of one racial group over the others, Lyris a doctrine claiming the existence of biological differences between various races and the superiority of one of them, supplement to the grand literature, a theory of the hierarchy of races based on a belief that social conditions depend on racial characteristics, Robert, a theory of racial hierarchy which claims the necessity of preserving the so-called superior race from miscegenation and the right to dominate other races, 
Petty Robert, etc. UNESCO's 1978 Declaration on Race defines racism as any theory claiming the intrinsic superiority or inferiority of racial or ethnic groups which would give to some the right to dominate or even eliminate others, presumed inferior, or basing value judgments on racial differences. Ruth Benedict writes, Racism is a dogma according to which one ethnic group is condemned by nature to congenital superiority. More recently, author Kriegel has written, Racism is an ideological scientific system which divides the contemporary human species into subspecies, resulting from separate development and endowed with unequal average aptitudes. Miscegenation with these inferior subspecies could only result in half-breeds inferior to the favored race. None of these definitions deals with behavior. Rather, they all focus on theory, a system, a doctrine, a dogma. These theories share two major characteristics, belief in the inequality of various races, and that this inequality legitimates domination of so-called inferior races by those deemed superior. More sophisticated definitions have been suggested, and the literature, on this subject is considerable. For the most part, these definitions echo those already discussed, and they suggest five main components as constituent elements of racist ideology. 1. A belief in the superiority of one race, and more rarely of several races, over others. This belief is usually accompanied by a hierarchical classification of racial groups. 2. The idea that this superiority and inferiority are of a biological or bioanthropological nature. The conclusion drawn from this belief is that superiority and inferiority are ineradicable and could not, for example, be modified by social milieu or education. 3. The idea that collective biological inequalities are reflected in social and cultural orders, and that biological superiority translates into a superior civilization, which itself indicates biological superiority. This implies a continuity between biology and social conditions. Four, a belief in the legitimacy of the domination of inferior races by superior ones. 5. A belief that there are pure races and that miscegenation has an inevitably negative effect on them, decline, degeneration, etc. The question is whether one can infer racism when, and only when, all these theoretical traits are present, or if there are some elements more fundamental than others. The first point is that, above all, Racism is a theory of racial hierarchy and inequality. This is fundamental. As to the rest, things are more complicated. First of all, a racist viewpoint does not require any knowledge of biology, nor recourse to biology, to explain perceived racial inequality. Most 18th century liberal authors and enlightened philosophies were convinced of the inferiority of blacks, but they did not necessarily relate this inferiority to any natural constitution. Most did not even raise biological questions. Others explained inferiority in terms of customs, habits, climate, etc. David Hume wrote, I am led to believe that blacks and in general all other human races, for there are four or five different types, are naturally inferior to whites. He did not base this conviction on any biological consideration. This is also true of Locke, who was a well-known apologist for slavery as were many Enlightenment philosophies. For most of them, the idea that reason resided fully in each person, Descartes, sufficed to nurture the certitude that anyone can, on his own, recognize the superiority of European civilization. Conversely, in the 19th century, the many writers who sought to relate sociology to biology did not necessarily make racist judgments. This is the case with some social Darwinists, such as Herbert Spencer, who was a pacifist and a believer in the idea of progress. Lastly, in the 20th century, some racist authors even objected to any recourse to biology and went so far as to denounce biological racism as madness. Nor is the idea of a pure race, essentially a romantic notion, accepted by all racist theoreticians. Albert Mimi is wrong in claiming that racist ideology is based on three postulates, that pure races do, in fact, exist, that pure races are superior to others, that, since these races are pure, their members deserve political, economic, and cultural advantages. The eugenicist Carl Pearson, whose work is tainted by racist judgments, constantly fought against the idea of a pure race.
Arthur de Gobina himself wrote his essay for one reason, to prove that pure races had disappeared for good. For Houston Stewart Chamberlain, as for Rene Marshall, all that matters is racial achievements. Likewise, for many racist writers, superiority is not automatically associated with the idea, or fantasy, of purity. Opinion is also divided on the issue of miscegenation. In the 19th and early 20th centuries almost all anthropologists saw miscegenation as an element of degeneracy with reference to anthropological distinctions between the races, Charles Robin. By contrast, Auguste Comte did not propose racial hierarchies and even supported appropriate miscegenation, though he had written in his Catechism Positive Eist, 1852, that the different races did not have the same type of brain. The Saint Simonian Victor Quartet, a clear precursor of racism, thought that, by miscegenation, it would be possible to regenerate humanity. He wrote enthusiastically, Long live miscegenation, for which he was later considered a communist. More recently, Frank H. Hankins has challenged the perverse and doctrinaire assertions of egalitarians on racial matters. He writes, It seems clear that the races are equal in no way whatsoever. But, at the same time, he emphatically supports miscegenation. The issue of the instrumentalization of racial theories is equally complex. For Mimi, racism offers overall and final validity to the idea of biological differences, real or imagined all to the advantage of the dominant party or to the detriment of the victim, in order to legitimate an act of aggression or certain privileges. This definition differs from the previous ones. In this case, racist domination is no longer seen as a result or as a potential consequence of theory. On the contrary, theory is seen as resulting from the intention to dominate or exploit. Thus, Racist ideology turns into a theory forged to justify an act of aggression or to legitimate a relation of domination from which one would expect to profit. Racism, then, becomes a belief which justifies behavior. This is not unlike the idea that class consciousness is the driving force of proletarian action. It is also similar to so-called conspiracy theory, a pseudo-explanatory construct occasionally used by victims of racism. Close to Mimi is Colette Gilliman, for whom racism is not so much a theory or an opinion but a social relation. She writes, This is a very particular relation, one of domination, which is seen as completely natural. More broadly, racism is generated from the normalization of a relation of domination. This idea is frequently espoused by authors who see an intimate relation between racism, colonialism, imperialism, etc. This alleged relation between racism and domination is, at best, tenuous. Of course, belief in the natural inequality of the races helps legitimate relations of domination or exploitation, particularly colonialist ones. It is also clear, however, that racism can just as well lead to a desire to banish others, to set them apart. Whereas domination implies contact, it can, nonetheless, express itself as rejection pure and simple, or as an abhorrence not directly related to the desire for domination. To the extent that it is a phobia, racial xenophobia is not concerned so much with domination, of the other as with its removal, to its disappearance from everyday life. Racist opponents of immigrant workers do not want to exploit them, they want to see them gone. Thus, the idea that there is a hierarchy among the races does not necessarily imply domination, and it is unwarranted to explain racial hierarchies merely on the basis of a perverse desire to realize personal profit or advantage from exploitation. Moreover, if racism has often accompanied and even encouraged colonialism, sometimes racist beliefs have also played the opposite role. William B. Cohen writes, it has been suggested that racist theories developed in the second half of the 19th century were the basis of French imperialism. But, a number of those who believed in the inferiority of the black race were opposed to French colonial expansion in overseas territories. Colonialism is a relation, even if one of domination. Moreover, historically, racist domination has never precluded miscegenation while at times opposition to colonialism has also been motivated by opposition to miscegenation. Gobiner vigorously denounced all forms of colonialism, Broca invade against the subordination of one race to another. Gustave Le Bon, 
who believed in racial inequality, was one of the staunchest opponents of colonial expansion. In 1910, he criticized colonialist stupidity and barbarity because hitherto, no race has ever been able to change its fundamental mental constitution in order to adopt that of another race. On the contrary, throughout the 19th century, the ideology resulting from the 1789 French Revolution not only did not curb colonial expansion, but actually encouraged it. In particular, French colonialism evolved largely in the name of progress. It assumed that the Western world had a mission to extend the blessings of the ideology of human rights to all colonialized peoples. In England, as in France, in polemics concerning slavery, the most fervent abolitionists were almost always avid advocates of colonialism. Seen as an obvious fact, belief in racial inequality nourished a certain paternalism, which was not devoid of traces of sympathy for these children, that is, indigenous peoples. Lord Acton thought that the existence of inferior races sufficed to justify their political union with intellectually superior ones, and this for the very purpose of remedying their, perceived inferiority. Jules Ferry claimed that superior races have the duty to protect and guide inferior races. On July 9, 1925, Leon Bloom addressed the Chamber des Deputes. We acknowledge the right and even the duty of superior races to draw unto themselves those races which have not reached the same cultural level and to challenge them to a level of progress which can only be achieved through the contributions of science and industry. The doctrine of colonialism unquestionably mixes racist judgments with an apology for colonialism, although these racist judgments should be placed within their historical and cultural contexts. Colonial doctrine also tends to legitimate colonial domination by appealing to typically democratic values, through the politics of assimilation which, during the Third Republic, won almost unanimous acceptance. This led Maurice Violet, a socialist, to argue, while addressing the League of the Rights of Men in February, 1931, that, I do not know of any colonial politics possible other than that of assimilation. I cannot understand the thesis held by some that the colonial native should evolve, as they say, on his own and within his own civilization. In this context, depending on the degree of individual conviction, many regarded ideas of superiority and inferiority to be provisional. During the 19th century many people claimed that there were inferior races, but they also thought it possible to elevate them to the level enjoyed by superior races. Whatever the cause, this barbarity is not irremediable. Seen from the perspective of a linear historical evolution, it is only an arrested state of development. They believed it is through colonialism that these peoples, who had somehow fallen behind, could catch up. The Indonesian peoples and the black races of Africa, wrote Emil Myrx, have hitherto remained in a condition bordering on barbarity. But does that permit us to deny their capacity for progress and possibilities for their future? This statement is typical. Its ethnocentrism is evident. Everyone calls barbarity what he is not accustomed to, wrote Montaigne long ago. Also evident in Marx is a racist perspective. Yet, his outlook did not reflect the ideas rest of his time. Thus, in depicting racism simply as an ideology justifying domination, especially of a colonial nature, one risks making the mistake of projecting current views onto the past. Domination implies inclusion, and thus acceptance. Of course, it is inclusion into a hierarchical structure where the victim occupies a subordinate position. Yet, the structure is, first and foremost, one of integration, even if there is, secondarily, the interplay of exclusion created by one's placement within a certain level of that hierarchy. To reiterate, it is racism that generates exclusion and isolation, rather than inclusion. The racist who believes that there are too many immigrants in France is hardly satisfied with the fact that these immigrants occupy a low position within the social ladder. What the racist wishes is their departure, their disappearance from sight, their being expelled from any position whatever in the established hierarchy. Moreover, recent research has shown that hierarchical systems cannot be analyzed or understood exclusively in terms of exploitation, domination or even contempt. Hierarchy is not synonymous with inequality. Jean-Pierre Dupuy writes, 
The most favorable context for mutual racial respect is not one where the principle of equality takes precedence, but rather where hierarchy is observed. A prerequisite for understanding this proposition is not to confuse hierarchy and inequality, but rather to see them as opposites. In fact, the hierarchic principle is one of inclusion for those who are different. Certain hierarchies are merely differentiated structures in which all the parts are equally indispensable for the well-functioning of the whole. Similarly, in many traditional societies, subordination is not synonymous with inferiority. In India the caste system has traditionally been seen as a system of holistic complementarity which, far from establishing exclusion, prevents excluding anyone. In this case, hierarchy is nothing more than the order which results when individual worth comes into play. Jacques Dupuy has even ventured that, in loosing the caste system, with its hierarchical acceptance of subordination, India would lose what has assured both the equilibrium and mutual tolerance of its communities. In fact, only secondarily can racist ideology eventually be used to legitimate domination. A classic example is the colonizer's racist attitude toward the colonized. To a large extent, this attitude survives in the way some Westerners see the Third World, if these countries do not succeed in developing, it is because they are fundamentally incapable to do so. In this instance race functions as an explanation, for their underdevelopment, and as the legitimation, it is, therefore, permissible to usurp from these incompetents their power or authority. There are also numerous examples of rivalries between races, countries, or ethnic groups, particularly between those closely related. The modern nation has been naturalized by being systematically associated with a series of biological givens. Thus, in 19th century England, anti-Irish racism was widespread. Authors such as John Stuart Mill or Matthew Arnold explain the endemic poverty of the Irish people in terms of racial deficiency while Sir Robert Peel coldly proposed the gradual extinction of the Celtic race in Ireland. In France, in the context of WWI, a scholar such as Barillon, in a series of astounding publications, boldly stated that German flesh is not like that of the French and that the German race has a unique bodily chemistry that produces sui generis and nauseating odor, noticeable the moment one approaches a German. He went so far as to claim that a racial instinct impels Germans to sully both the public buildings and the homes which they inhabit. In light of all this, a number of authors have distinguished between a racism of exclusion and one of domination, a seemingly well-grounded distinction. On the other hand, when it comes to evaluating objectively how dangerous each of these two categories is, opinion is divided. The uncertainty stems from the fact that exclusion can be much more benign than domination when it limits itself to refusing contact without interfering with the lifestyles of those excluded, but it can also be much more deadly, as when it leads to extermination. Another distinction, more rarely made, is between racism, properly speaking, and what might be called, for want of a better term, racialism, that is, theory based on the idea that racial factors or more generally, ethnic factors, play a determining role in the evolution of human society. From this perspective, socio-cultural roots are traced primarily or exclusively in terms of ethnic groups, and the great events of human history are systematically reduced to events of the racial order. In short, racialism postulates that the concept of race is the key to understanding the fundamental determinants of major social configurations. Thus, for Victor Quartet, on almost every point the issue is race. In 1850, the Scottish anatomist Robert Knox wrote, Race is everything, literature, science, art, in a word, civilization, all depend on race. In Germany, the social Darwinist Ludwig Woltmann, a former social democrat, explained the Renaissance by the presence, in North and Central Italy, of Germanic blood. In England, Benjamin Disraeli was also an advocate of racialism. Hannah Arendt saw him as the first Englishman to have insisted unrelentingly on his racial convictions and on racial superiority as a determining element in history and politics. Likewise, Gabina interpreted all human history in racial terms. Although, contrary to widespread opinion, his influence on national socialism was almost nil.
Similar viewpoints were popular in Germany in the 1930s and 1940s. For Edward Mangold, racial differences provide the key for understanding all major events of human history. In varying degrees, this theme of race as a determining factor is found in Newton, Montesquieu, Auguste Thierry, Camille Jallian, D. Ictel, Vyri, Buffon, and even Gazette. In genuine racialism, the racial factor is considered primordial and not just an element to be considered among an infinity of others. Moreover, true racialism maintains that there is a causal connection, often an almost mechanistic one, between the racial order and the socio-cultural domain in the sense that the former determines the latter. In addition, racialism does not imply racial inequality, and this is what fundamentally distinguishes racialism from racism. At first glance, in its most blatant, form, racism seems to be the result of a fusion of racialism and a belief in racial inequality. Moreover, it is clear how one can go from one to the other, if race is the central determinant of human affairs, it is tempting, to say the least, to explain balances of power which have been established throughout the world by the racial characteristics of the opposing parties. Yet, racialism and racism do not always intersect. By itself, racialism does not imply hierarchical value judgments. It limits itself to distinguishing between the races, eventually to classifying and attributing to them a determining role in social life. But to distinguish or classify is not the same as to create a hierarchy. To categorize is to list similarities and differences, affinities which permit drawing some boundaries between the various races. Hierarchy, on the other hand, implies a paradigm and this paradigm is the distinctive characteristic of racist ideology. Moreover, this paradigm is almost always ethnocentric, that is, self-referential. That is why sometimes racialism can be rachophile, but racist ideology is always rachophobic, it inevitably deprecates its object. Racialism adds the central importance of race to the simple idea that there is a link between the physical characteristics of individuals and groups and their mental characteristics, between the biological and the social. Racist ideology adds to racialism a discriminating value judgment. Races are arranged hierarchically. But racist ideology does not necessarily imply racialism. One can actually believe that there have always been inferior and superior races without believing that all social phenomena are reducible to racial factors. A belief in racial inequality and the idea that race is the main factor in human history are not two different versions of the same idea. The racial hierarchy drawn by racist ideology is almost always linear, with one race invariably at the top, followed immediately by its civilization. The entire schema is marked by an orderliness which immediately signals the underlying ethnocentrism. In general, whereas racialism emphasizes the decisive importance of race, racist ideology emphasizes the importance of a particular race, for example, Gobanizarians or Victor Cortez Germans, seen as the nation's oil. As Chamberlain wrote, our entire civilization and all our current culture are the product of a single race, the Germans a heading under which he also places Celts and the Slavs. For Hitler the Aryan laid the foundations and set the framework for all human accomplishments. All these great past civilizations fell into ruin simply because the race which at first was creative later died from blood poisoning. Gobin is S.I. Sur Linegalite de Races Humains, 1853-1855, is clearly based both on racialism and racism as previously defined. The book's title speaks for itself, and is repeated in the heading of Chapter 13, Races Are Intellectually Unequal. This work attempts to explain all of human history in terms of natural phenomena. Unlike the disdain in which Tocqueville held Arab culture during the same period, Gabbana expresses admiration for Islamic civilization. Nor is Gabbana anti-Semitic. He sings the praises of Greek art in which he sees the fruit of a felicitous mixture of racial bloodlines where the Asiatic strain predominates, and he considers blacks as the founding fathers of what he calls artistic feeling. The Aryans, whose superiority he vigorously upholds, evolved over a long period of time. Himself a connoisseur of Mediterranean culture and of the Near East, Gabbana did not share most of his compatriots' attitudes toward indigenous peoples, 
On March 22, 1855, he wrote to Prox from Cairo, Europeans are not very commendable, and they constantly justify the disdain and even hatred in which they are held by indigenous populations. When all is said and done, his writings owe more to literary influences, specifically Romanticism, than to ideology. In addition, racist ideology includes two very different perspectives, one pessimistic and another optimistic. For a number of racist ideologues, racial phenomena are used primarily to explain in retrospect the state of decline into which the white race has supposedly fallen. This type of racist ideology is part of decadence theory and belongs with other equally pessimistic visions. It explains the current state of affairs in terms of the weakening of bloodlines, miscegenation, etc. Current problems are seen as due to the domination of the white races by races of color. This causality is depicted either as an irreversible fait accompli, gobina, or as a threat that has already begun to materialize. Other authors perceive racial struggle from an optimistic viewpoint, which seems to bear the imprint of social Darwinism. Chamberlain shares this outlook when he writes, even if it were proven that there never has been an Aryan race in the past, we would want one for the future. Later, he writes, far from being heaven sent, race develops over time, and only slowly does racial purity win out. On this point, as on many others, Chamberlain disagrees with Gobina. Curiously, Hitler shared this optimism. His racist project is akin to the eugenic viewpoint in the sense of racial hygiene, race is not so much an acquired characteristic to be preserved, as an objective to attain and a reality to bring about, race is less the voice of the past as it is the call of the future belief in a continuum between the biological and the social permits belief that natural selection in human society continues to operate in the sense of promoting the best. From this perspective, history is fundamentally correct, it is the strongest, the fittest, etc. who went out. Two largely contradictory social Darwinist strands are at work here. On the one hand, there are those who believe that natural selection operates in human societies as in the state of nature a belief held especially by Anglo-Saxon writers and by Hitler. On the other hand, there are those who believe the opposite, that the free play of natural selection in the social sphere runs into conflicts with certain counter-selections, Vacher de la Pauge, which call for voluntary corrections and, thus, state intervention. Here the link between the first variant and liberal ideology is clear. The same invisible hand that is supposed to re-establish automatically the optimum economic state is also supposed to assure optimum social relations and interactions. Free competition and natural selection operate on the same principle. The second variant is decidedly interventionist, paradoxically contradicting its initial postulate, if there is a continuum between the biological and the social spheres, why does natural selection not operate naturally in human societies? Joseph Gabel claims that racism derives from social Darwinism. This needs a qualification. Obviously, with the aid of social Darwinism, Darwin's ideas reinforce 19th century racist ideas. Evidently, it was appealing to depict the white race as the most thoroughly evolved and developed branch of the human race. The fact remains, however, that there was racism, including its theoretical formulations, well before Darwin and that many racist authors were fundamentally hostile to Darwin and the theory of evolution, on the grounds that it was one of the major avatars of the theory of progress. Conversely, not all social Darwinists have been racist. Social Darwinism differs from racism by being elitist. As such, it is not overly bound by ethnic considerations, whereas, in sound racist logic, a white should feel closer to a street sweeper of his own race than to a Chinese Nobel Prize winner. In reality, beside the obvious tendency to biologize social relations, the common ground between racism and social Darwinism is the idea of a race war. From this viewpoint, racial conflict becomes one of the elements of universal selection. Here the names of Vacher de la Pauge and his German counterpart, Otto Ammann, come immediately to mind. Yet, they are not the most important. In fact, the main theoretician of racial struggle was the Pole, Ludwig Gumplowitz. Along with those of the German sociologist, Gustav Ratzenhofer, his ideas, 
would be popularized in the U.S. by Abian Small. For Gumplowicz's, struggle is a primordial and inevitable relation between different racial groups, and the state is the political instrument created by the victorious race to assure its domination over the vanquished race. Thus, the critique of racialism and racist ideology is clear. In pretending to be universal, racialism turns out to be reductive. Attributing to racial factors a central, determining role in understanding human affairs takes its place alongside similar systems, which also posit their own ultimate categories, economics, class, sexuality, the subconscious, etc. Moreover, the mechanistic causal relation established between race and culture is untenable. To posit such a connection is to dismiss the social interaction found in all societies, and to deny the specific character of historical factors and social relations. Any survey of history immediately reveals that the vast majority of great social and cultural transformations in the past were not a function of racial or ethnic phenomena. From this viewpoint, racialism implies an unacceptable naturalization of social phenomena. In the conclusion of his essay, Gabbana explicitly sets his goal to bring history into the domain of the natural sciences. This project is revealing. He overlooks the fact that human societies are also living systems, or that man is also an animal. Rather, he systematically erases everything typical of the human phenomenon. Race and society are then related causally. The racial signifies the social which, apart from the racial, is no more than an incomprehensible epiphenomenon. The human is exclusively reduced to the merely living, and sociology is reduced to zoology. Similarly, recourse to race functions as an absolute justification, that is, as a substitute for theological justification. What is rejected is the capacity of human beings, based on their natural hereditary makeup, to constitute themselves through choices and lived experiences. Similarly, education becomes nothing more than the training of a pre-programmed personality. Free will disappears. Ultimately, social life is something operating independently of any real persons. One frequently observes in racist ideology an essentialist obsession with naturalness. This obsession relates closely to the emergence of a new concept of nature, steadily drawn away from the biological sphere and toward the socio-political one. In racist discourse, an expression such as a naturally inferior people conveys, at one and the same time, the idea of biological and definitive inferiority. Biology becomes a substitute for, or a representation of fate, thus, a natural inferiority is a permanent inferiority, for all time, forever, not susceptible to corrections or modifications by any means. Racialism degenerates into essentialism when it defines race as an invariable ideal type, independent of the historical, social or cultural circumstances to be found to some degree or another, affecting the various members of a social group. From this perspective which, paradoxically, becomes subtly egalitarian, all individuals become equivalent and even interchangeable, they are first of all, and uniquely, the representatives of a group with general characteristics. Thus, acceptance of any member of the group will lead, sooner or later, to acceptance of all others. In this sense, the value of the individual becomes synonymous with the value of his race. The appeal to nature, particularly to biological nature, functions then to legitimate the perpetuation of that race as it is, doing away with any contingencies, everything is fixed once and for all, they are not subject to revision. A priori judgments become simultaneously eternalized and generalized. Racist thought also does not allow for exceptions and in this way prejudice is born and nurtured. To brand this essentialism racist, Colette Gilliman uses the expression Sazie's racialicent. By suspending time, diachronic reality is reorganized synchronically. Spatial continuity takes absolute precedence over temporal discontinuity. The blending of the concepts of culture and nature has led some Marxist writers such as Lukax, Mannheim and Kaersch to point out the anti-dialectical nature of racism. Thus, there is a tendency to reify categories, that is, to think in terms of things, as well as an inclination to emphasize the fundamental stability of data which, despite their permanent and lasting aspects, 
ought to be apprehended in terms of relations and dynamic change. This approach is interesting, even if only because it clearly reveals the limits of the rapprochement currently being attempted between Darwinism, social or otherwise, and racism. If racism is an essentialism, an ideology where the concept of nature is regarded as an unchanging essence, there is a problem, then, drawing on a theory of evolution whose central thesis implies transformation and change. It should be pointed out, however, that essentialist modes of thought are not unique to racism, or even to racialism. Rather, essentialist thinking seems to correspond to a certain propensity of the human mind, and it is easy to cite many other examples of such thinking. The gaze, which engenders representation, be it the gaze of the racist or of his victim, distinguishes only with great difficulty a single element from the whole to which it belongs. Thus, Raymond Aron speaks of the inverted essentialism of those who tend to depict all colonizers, anti-Semites, Southern whites, in the U.S., as essentially defined by their disdain for indigenous peoples, their hatred for Jews, their desire for segregation. Such an approach, he adds, leads to a depiction of the colonizer, the anti-Semite, or the Southern white, which is as coherent and comprehensive as the stereotype of Jews, indigenous peoples, or blacks. Race functions in racist ideology in the same way class functions in Marxist ideology. This rapprochement is justified by those writers who claim that membership in social class is as decisive and universal a determinant as belonging to a given race, although, obviously, it is less easy to change one's race than to change one's social class. A similar parallel can be drawn between the Marxist theory of the class struggle and Gumplowich's almost contemporary theory of the Rassenkampf. In both cases, a particular antagonism becomes what explains all human history. According to Marx and Engels, the history of all societies that have existed up to now is the history of class struggle. In both cases, perhaps under the influence of Darwin's survival of the fittest and the struggle for life, the proposed vision is largely one of a war, certain classes must be eliminated, Marxism, certain races can be done away with, racism. Racial war on the one hand, and general civil war, on the other, in each case, theory legitimates the separation or elimination of the other by conjuring up a pejorative and frightening image of the other, the bourgeoisie as exploitative, people of color as threatening. In both cases, the fundamental concept is endowed with an absolute operational rigidity, class and race become quasi-metaphysical entities one can appeal to in order to definitively understand essential reality which, always and everywhere, is at work under epiphenomena and superstructures. The fact that racist action frequently results in domination, while, on the contrary, class action is supposed to, in theory at least, in exploitation, in no way changes this fundamental structural similarity. Surprisingly, there is a relative conceptual interchangeability between the two ideas. Both race and class can play the same explanatory role. According to certain proponents of racialism, ethnicity explains class differences. In his essay Sir Lano Bless, 1732, Henry de Blainvilliers set out to explore the history of France in light of an antagonism between the Frankish race, which generated the nobility, and the Gallic race, from which the common people come. This the Ori, which identifies the French aristocracy with German or Frank ancestors, and the common people as descendants of the Gauls or the Gallo-Romans, enjoyed considerable popularity in the 18th and 19th centuries. It also explained past social tensions by the uneasy cohabitation of two peoples within a single nation. This theory was refuted by Benold and Benjamin Constant, but it re-emerges with Quartet de Lisle, Augustin Thierry, and even Gizet and Montlogier. It is the same, for racist theoreticians. Class struggle is to be interpreted in racial terms, for Marxist theoreticians, it is racial struggle which is to be interpreted in terms of class. Thus, before we I, George's Pulitzer accused Nazism of misleading proletarian consciousness by replacing class consciousness with the idea of racial belonging. More recently, the Soviet anthropologist Mikhail Nestork has written, Reactionary scholars commit a major error by replacing the doctrine of class struggle with the pseudo-theory of racial conflict as the driving force in the development of the human race.
As for belief in racial inequality, clearly it is based on ethnocentrism which, most of the time, is not understood as such and, therefore, becomes universally accepted as fact. Specific characteristics are seen as universal truths, which themselves are seen as referring to specific characteristics. To create a racial hierarchy from the viewpoint of culture and civilization implies the existence of a criterion, which is not the projection of any one culture but which would permit ranking all of them objectively. Such a criterion, however, does not exist. The very idea of a socio cultural criterion independent of any particular society or culture, which could be taken as a unique first principle and a universal norm, is based on a contradiction. Any criterion used to outline a cultural hierarchy can be derived only from the extrapolation of norms or social values proper to a given culture. By itself it cannot provide any understanding as to why it is an appropriate norm, nor any objective evidence as to why it should be adopted universally. To establish a hierarchy of racial inequality necessitates evaluating on the basis of both the behavior and the accomplishments of one of the races, most often of the race establishing the hierarchy. In order to explain this approach, there is no need to impute bad intentions or even an invincible desire for domination or profit. It is simply the result of the tendency of the human mind to consider itself the norm, in relation to which the other can and must be judged. In fact, the value of a culture can only be evaluated in the context of that culture and in terms of how its members perceive what it does for them. One of the fundamental principles of cultural relativism is that judgments formulated on the basis of the experiences of individual members of a culture can be interpreted only with reference to their own cultural milieu. In the same way, a culture performs more or less well in relation to its own norms or according to the objectives it has set for itself, most notably with reference to adaptability. Thus, at most. What can be said is that each people is superior to other peoples by being true to itself, by being whatever it is, and that all races are equally capable of being whatever they are. This reasoning, of course, is purely deontological. The lack of a paradigm encapsulating all cultures and allowing absolute judgments challenges the racist belief in the statutory inequality of peoples and races. It also undermines the better intentioned but equally ethnocentric belief that primitive peoples are somehow backward and that it is appropriate to acculturate them according to a model upheld by those who are more advanced. As already indicated, this belief has inspired the politics of assimilation of colonial imperialism, and today it is still presupposed by certain logics of economic development. From this viewpoint, the spatial configuration is temporalized. So called primitive peoples are supposed to evoke images of the Western past, while being offered a vision of their future. The West is once again proposed as an exemplary model of the kind of social ideal to be attained. The result is not much different from that of classical racist strategy it treats local social structures as inferior, obliterates collective identities and differentiated lifestyles, encourages behavioral imitation of established models and the institutionalizing it a facto inequality. The philosophical sources of racist ideology are more numerous than one would think. The West's monotheism has not been conducive to tolerance. For a long time, the idea that there is only one God, one truth and thus implicitly one model of civilization has legitimated racially intolerant behavior. To suppress allegedly bloodthirsty pagan cults was to eradicate evil and save souls even at the price of the lives of those whose souls were being saved. In some instances, this led to the disappearance of entire populations. The typical example is that of Latin American natives. For a time theologians even debated whether they had a soul. The Bible sanctions the execution of idolaters as a sacred duty. One of the canons adopted at the Lateran Council of 1215 declared, those who kill heretics are not guilty of murder, Homest is non esse qui heretici drew side and scholastic rationalism privileged classifications. The school of ontological realism proposed the idea of a natural essence, which later turned into the idea of biological nature. But empiricism, with its concept of the tabula rasa and the all determining role of the environment, has not exercised a more positive influence. Locke, who was anti essentialist, 
insisted strongly that all human characteristics are rooted in a first substance, it thus became possible to speak of human essence in a way Cartesianism could not. The idea that man is infinitely malleable may appear preferable to the theory of biological determinism, but the idea of an infinitely changing mankind poses considerable problems concerning the legitimacy of conditioning, the validity of the criteria and of the chosen models. Thus there is the danger of falling back into ethnocentrism. In view of all this, it is clear that it is not an easy task to define racist ideology. To the extent that they deal with particulars, most definitions raise serious questions and allow for too many exceptions. A useful definition of racism in terms of ideology should be applicable to all cases. A careful examination of racist discourse, however, reveals only one constant, belief in the inequality of the human races, which implies, as a logical consequence, the inequality of cultures and civilizations. From this, racist ideology, a, may or may not seek in biology an explanation for the inequality it believes it perceives, b, may or may not adhere to racialism, that is, the theory according to which race is the fundamental given in history, c, may or may not legitimate domination or, on the contrary, exclusion and isolation, d, may or may not rule out miscegenation, e, may or may not hold that the inequality it postulates is unchangeable or, on the contrary, that it is possible to reverse inequality by acculturating others by means of an implicitly ethnocentric model. During the last decades, there have been various efforts to redefine racism. One of these, not very rigorous, consists in generalizing racism to include any attitude of intolerance, aggressiveness of belief, or a priori rejection of any group. Thus, racism becomes synonymous with phobias of any other, for example, ageism, misogyny, anti-young, anti-police, anti-workers, anti-unmarried people, etc. This usage seems to be based on a quasi-pleonism, with racism functioning, in extreme cases, as a duplication of anti. Here, racism extends far beyond its traditionally understood limits. In May, 1985, the French parliament adopted a law extending racism to include sexism. For his part, Christian Della Campaign, who saw the broadening of racism as resulting from the widespread diffusion in Western societies of the technocratic age, of guilt feelings resulting from the various genocides carried out by Westerners since the outset of the 20th century, today admits that in certain situations, any type of conflict can take on a racist connotation, for example, male-slash-female or labor, management antagonisms. From this perspective, Racism would mean going to extremes, to radicalize hostilities and to encourage dogmatic judgments based on stereotypes and prejudices. This use of racism is questionable, and the reasoning behind it specious. At first sight, branding a hostile position as racist could seem to benefit those who use this tactic by heaping on adversaries the disapproval the term racism entails. In fact, the result may be the exact opposite. If all aggressive behavior is racist, racism becomes as normal as ordinary feelings of hostility, hatred, aggression, feelings present at all times and in every society. If everyone is racist, no one is racist, dilution leads to trivialization, diluting responsibility is a classical tactic for relieving the guilty of their guilt. Moreover, such a definition of racism would give the laws against racism such a scope that they would become unenforceable. A more serious redefinition is that any belief or claim that there are human races is already racist, independent of any evaluation of these races. For Della Campaign, a racist is anyone who believes in the existence of races even if one refuses to make value judgments concerning them or to establish a hierarchy among them. This is a relatively recent position, it would not even have occurred to the most committed anti-racists several decades ago. It is supported by a concomitant claim that current science disproves the existence of races. It marks an important turning point in the evolution of anti-racist discourse, which traditionally has wavered between two contradictory ideas, first, that biology is insignificant in relation to social phenomena, and, second, that biology disproves racist claims. This new position, that is, 
that it is racist to hold that races even exist, has a semblance of coherence about it. Racist ideology uses the existence of different races as its point of departure for arguing for their inequality. If races could be shown not to exist, then racist ideology would fall apart. But construing racist ideology as pure discourse is an overintellectualization. By eliminating the word, one hopes to eliminate the thing. Aside from this position's undeniably ideological motivations, the view is based on the fact that, since the end of the 1950s, because of the emergence of population genetics, in the scientific community the term race has been increasingly replaced by that of population. Research on gene frequencies and genetic pools have displaced traditional morphological studies of phenotypes. Writers such as A. E. Morant or Jacques Ruffy have played an important role in this evolution, an evolution encouraged by recent progress in immunology and geographic hematology, by the discovery of numerous new blood groups, of genetic markers, of the HLA system, etc. Some population geneticists have suggested that the study of genetic modulations and distances between genetic pools do not support the concept of traditional races that variations within a race are more important as differences between various races. Clearly, races have more characteristics in common than those distinguishing them, and there is no clearly defined boundaries between them, not only due to the fact of interracial reproduction, but also because one finds between these various, traditional racial types all sorts of intermediary types. This has led some to conclude that races do not exist. Deprived of its operational value and of its objective biological basis, the notion of race becomes pure fiction. This dismissal of the idea of race is accompanied by claims concerning the benefits, or at least the biological harmlessness, of miscegenation. Such a viewpoint, rare in the past, has some precedents. In the 19th century this position was held by Michelet who devoted a chapter of his 1833 Histoire de France to the unhappy destiny of those races which have remained pure, as well as by Armand de Quadra of Ages, 1810-1892, according to whom the future belongs to races which have intermarried. This position has also been vigorously advocated by Jacques Ruffy in respect to the intermarriage of whites and blacks. The point here is not to examine this viewpoint, which is the result of a profound change of outlook, but to note that it arises from a double paradox. On the one hand, if races did not exist, it is strange to suggest that they can intermarry. The same applies to multiracial societies, it is difficult for races to be many and non-existent at the same time, on the other hand, it is no less paradoxical to claim that the question of miscegenation is settled since it poses no biological problem, while rightly emphasizing that in human society, Sociocultural factors are far more important and decisive than biological ones. In fact, hostility to miscegenation may very well be inspired by cultural or religious considerations having nothing to do with racism. Moreover, it is well known that in societies where there are many interracial marriages, the social status of these married couples depends, to a large extent, on their closeness to the dominant racial phenotype all of which impacts on the marriage and on genetic selection. The thesis according to which science considers the idea of race inoperative, non-existent, without foundation, etc., and maintains that it would be racist to hold the opposite, runs into numerous problems. First of all, this thesis treats science as a field of knowledge where positions are unanimous, which is certainly not the case. It is striking that, on the issue of the existence or non-existence of races, the non-existence of races is most firmly proposed by scholars whose disciplines are the farthest removed from anthropology. Scholarly certitude on this issue seems to increase with the distance of one's discipline from anthropology, a large number of journalists, a considerable number of sociologists and psychologists, a few population geneticists, but very few anthropologists. To that group may be added politically involved scholars, Albert Jacquard, Ashley Montague, Stephen Rose, Leon Comine, Richard Lou Wanton, et al., whose motivations are probably complex. Clearly, however, there is no unanimity on the issue, and this is confirmed by recent anthropological publications which continue, now more than ever, 
to use the concept of race and in no way question the existence nor the operational validity of racial realities. In the course of a UNESCO colloquium in Athens, March 30 to April 3, 1981, meant to denounce the various pseudoscientific theories invoked to justify racism and racial discrimination, the three following, contradictory, positions were proposed, that the concept of race in the human species does not correspond to any reality that could be objectively defined, Albert Jacquard, that, for humans, race is a biological reality, Lalita Prasad Vidyarthi, and that the theory of the non-existence of races is a false ideology, Evia Tarnevo. Thus, there is no agreement, even among scholars with a similar orientation and outlook. Sometimes similar contradictions can be found even within the work of a single author. In fact, the idea of race is almost as old as humanity itself. The first racial classification can be found in the Bible, in the passage dealing with Noah's lineage. Since then the word race has been employed in a metaphorical sense, as a synonym for nation, people, lineage, stock, house, extraction, etc. in the 18th, and especially in the 19th century, the flowering of the exact sciences facilitated cutting back on these many meanings, which only caused confusion and encouraged more rigorous definitions. For modern writers races are populations, differing from one another according to the incidence of certain genes and according to the frequency of certain hereditary traits whose phenotypic appearance more or less allows one to recognize visually their members. Among all the definitions proposed, the following is Glower's, race is a variety of the species Homo sapiens L, constituted by a group of human beings distinguishable from other groups by a complex of hereditary characteristics, anatomical and physiological, and probably also psychological, all observed over several generations, to the exclusion of all characteristics acquired through education, tradition, or social influence. Moreover, some population geneticists' arguments in support of the claim for the non-existence of races seem questionable. Consider the one based on the continuity between racial groups, found as early as 1843 in J. C. Pritchard's Histoire Naturelle de l'Homme. It is based on the continuity of genetic matter and human morphology and on the vast extent of interracial variations. Thus, Jacques Raffi writes, there is no biologically empty space between the races, on the contrary, there is one continuous strand well, this is obvious. Whoever claimed that there is not a common genetic thread running between all races? The presence of intermediaries has never been an argument against the extremes and the existence of intermediate ethnic groups does not discredit the idea of race any more than the idea of intermediaries between the young and elderly, between the dwarf and the giant, between hot and cold discredits the ideas of age, height, or temperature. The Alps and the Apennines are linked by mountains of low altitude, observes Enderthaw, but the Alps exist, as do the Apennines. Dobzhansky writes, to take the position that races did not exist because they do not constitute strictly defined groups is a return to the worst typological errors. It is almost as logical as claiming that cities do not exist because the countryside which separates them is not totally uninhabited. Moreover, the same reasoning could be used to prove that the definition of species, indeed even of genus, is just as conventional and arbitrary as that of race. Emphasizing the importance of interracial variation and the relative absence of genetic distance between the major racial groups does not lead much further. Recent research suggests that about 10% of racial differences can be attributed to biological variations within the human species. The significance of these statistics seems very weak when one realizes that genetic distance between man and some higher primates is also very limited. Solely in terms of genetic frequencies. There is a greater proximity between man and the chimpanzee than between the chimpanzee and the gorilla, or even between certain human groups and others. Moreover, most human blood types are found in the monkey, along with blood types unique to simians. The organization of chromosomes in man and the chimpanzee is so close that it is almost impossible to explain their phenotypic differences based only on chromosomes. Lack of agreement between some population geneticists and bioanthropologists, or physical anthropologists, stems from the fact that the two disciplines do not share the same starting point.
Geneticists take into consideration only characteristics whose genetic hereditary nature has been established beyond question, the amount of melanin, the presence of lactose, the rhesus system and the seriological properties of the blood, the HLA immune system, etc. Starting with these, geneticists establish the existence of genetic pools which, very often, do not correspond to racial groups. On the other hand, anthropologists start with existing populations and their actual phenotypes to identify and classify characteristic morphological types, defined by apparently hereditary characteristics, even if the mode of genetic transmission of these characteristics has not yet been identified or if it is not yet possible to quantify the genetic distance for these characteristics as regards individuals and groups, a classic example, eye color. In other words, anthropologists start with common perception, while population geneticists construct populations which do not necessarily correspond to this understanding. Under these circumstances, it is not surprising that the idea of race, while operative for the one group, is not for the other, thus the sometimes tumultuous relations between the two disciplines. At any rate, population geneticists tend to underestimate recent advances in biotypology, Chiskinowski, Wonk, and in paleoanthropology, Eve Coppins, Henry de Lumley, and Earth Oma, Pleianos, Vlasic, nor do they take into account the fact that contemporary bioanthropology is tending more and more to abandon the Linnean concept, based solely on resemblance from which an ideal type or prototype was deduced, in favor of Victor Bunock's approach, which sees race as a unity of phylogenetic derivation, recognizable by a small number of objective criteria. Of course, this is not to deny the merits of population genetics, but only to point out its limitations. A study of the geographical distribution of gene frequencies would not exhaust what can be known about human populations. Moreover a number of immunological properties are not unique to the human species. Many of them cannot to this day be organized into a coherent system. Population genetics thus risk creating artificial populations which do not correspond to populations as commonly understood. It should also be remembered that the goal of scientific knowledge is, above all, to explain, clarify, and deepen common understanding, not to mask it or to transform it into an optical illusion. Aware of the complexity of the issue, Andre Langani has adopted a middle course, it is no more reasonable to ignore morphological data to create a purely genetic history of man than to dismiss so-called genetic anthropology as do classical anthropologists. It would be better to seek out the sources of conflict between the two types of data by studying the bias of each. Furthermore, recent studies have shown that the results obtained by population genetics, when properly interpreted, in no way contradict the findings of a traditional bioanthropological approach and sometimes they even support the results obtained by more traditional approaches. On a more practical level, to the extent that it mimics militant anti-racism, the theory of the non-existence of races may betray a certain naivete. Does anyone really believe it possible to make racism disappear by fictionalizing race? While the genetic distance between a Breton and a Senegalese may well be less than that between a Breton and a Picard, even knowing this the Breton will surely feel closer to the Picard than to the African black. This is due to what might be called common perception. Geneticists may well stress that genetic pools do not necessarily correspond to phenotypes but it is not genetic pools that the average person meets on the street. Racists observe the existence of populations which appear, rightly or wrongly, as clearly different at every level, physical, social, cultural, etc., and from this they draw the wrong conclusions as to the presumed superiority or inferiority of the ones or the others. It is unlikely they will change their attitude upon learning that races did not exist and that somehow they have been the victims of an illusion. According to Dobzhansky, there is the risk that such a denial of race will only diminish the credibility of those scientists who uphold such a position. Ultimately, the issue for the militant anti-racist is not so much whether races exist or not, but to understand that, in any event, races are perceived as existing, and that what is important is that hierarchical and denigrating conclusions are no longer reached. The difficulty with this is that a racist reaction does not begin merely with the perception of bioanthropological difference, but also, 
and perhaps primarily, with the perception of socio-cultural difference. Significantly, anti-Arab xenophobia is much more widespread in France than anti-black xenophobia, although the racial distance is much less between the French and Arabs than between the French and black Africans. One must also take into consideration the essential role that the imaginary plays in the process of denigrating symbolization which governs much of racist reaction. As Gil Amin writes, race is, above all, a signifier, the suggested non-existence of race as a signified will make no difference whatsoever as regards racist reactions. Imagine races and real races play the same role in the social process and are thus identical as regards their function. This is the crux of the sociological problem. It is important to understand the sociological reality of race precisely at that point where real and imagined races take their place in the larger social process. Trying to determine what is concretely true or objectively false in racial perception is inadequate, it settles for a status quo of racial realities. Merely studying the bases for current racial realities does not address the sociological problem. There is a final and very different objection to the claim according to which science refutes the existence of races. Even if this is wrong, the meaning of the word refutes needs to be examined. In other words, does racist ideology operate on the level of proving and disproving, or, rather, more on the level of interpretation? Further, is it possible, without falling into the most banal scientism, to turn to science to establish the truth or falsity of various ideologies? To claim that, in the past, racist theories have only been upheld on pseudoscientific grounds may comfort the devout anti-racist, but it is not true. From Lynn and Blumenbach to Otmar von Verschuer, as well as to Vajar de la Pauge and many others, the scientific qualifications of a number of racist authors are beyond doubt. It would be mistaken to believe, with many racists, that racism is firmly grounded in science, or to believe, with some anti-racists, that the authors in question are only pseudoscientists. One problem is that scientists are no less vulnerable than others to propaganda and ideologies, if the history of science teaches anything, it is that knowledge has never protected anyone from erring. More fundamentally, the problem is that science only operates in the descriptive mode. As Nietzsche put it, science never creates values. When science says that one cannot found a racist theory scientifically, it does not refute racism any more than it upholds anti-racism. It only refutes one thing, that one can provide a scientific basis for anything having to do with ideological preference, be it racism or anti-racism. According to Jean-Pierre Dupuy, science has paid a price for basing itself on a single operational mode, to which it has owed and still owes its prodigious success. The price has been that it has nothing to say about desirable behavior in human affairs. Celestin Baugel also insisted on this at the outset of the 20th century, by nature science is mute on the necessity or inappropriateness of hierarchies, simply because it excludes, by virtue of the type of knowledge it establishes, all reference to values. As such, science has nothing to say for or against equality or inequality. By definition, science is contingent and subject to revisions, the work of science is never finished, but always evolving. From this viewpoint, to base anti-racist arguments on science is, inevitably, to leave them in a state of suspension. More seriously, such a strategy would imply, nolens volens, that the racism condemned today by science could, in the future, cease to be so. As Thillier notes, when it is a question of determining our practical attitude towards blacks, Arabs, or Indians, it is dangerous to give a decisive role to so-called scientific data. To angle for a yes from the experts, whether one intends it or not, is to allow that their negative response could make acceptable or even legitimate certain forms of segregation, racism, etc. In fact, scientific racism is the mirror image of scientific anti-racism, both stem from, if not scientism, at least from a misunderstanding of science. Ultimately, the claim that the simple observation of the existence of races stems from racism is untenable. It implies, bizarrely, that perception of races can only lead to negative evaluations. More seriously, it burdens well-reasoned anti-racism with a belief that risks compromising its credibility. In the end, 
the denial of the reality of race is reminiscent of the Sartrean theory of for the other, according to which the other, the black, the Jew, the woman, etc., only exists as such in the mind of the perceiver, and through the bias of the gaze. This position runs into the same difficulties as Sartre's denial of the actual existence of the other and resolves nothing. One cannot eliminate a shared perception, even in the name of science, by branding it as an illusion. Rather, it is more reasonable to follow current thinking, which sees racism as beginning with a value judgment, that is, with a shift from description to evaluation, and to the objectification of that evaluation. Jean Barstand has distinguished racial truths from racist lies, to be anti-racist does not imply denying the existence and endurance of racial differences, which would be scientific naivete. Rather, anti-racism implies denying that in the human species there are races which are superior to others. Most of all, racism implies denying that certain races may abrogate to themselves the right to mistreat or even disdain other races. Mimi has expressed a similar view, racism only begins with the interpretation of differences. This is also the position of most of those who have studied the question seriously. The idea that some mental or behavioral traits can be inherited or that a particular genotype can condition the expression of these traits is no more racist than the belief in the existence of races. The opposite position according to which cerebral activity is exempt from any biological determination, stems from a theory of acquired traits, a position today universally discredited. Or it can stem from a metaphysical position upholding the Cartesian distinction between body and mind. Today, however, the old debate over the innate and the acquired appears a bit obsolete. Biological determination of certain psychological characteristics never implies more than potentiality which leaves room for the influence of social conditioning, the former does not rule out the latter. On the other hand, to regard biological factors as a realm of fatalism and socio-cultural ones as the domain of freedom is to fall once again into the racist reasoning which starts by naturalizing and biologizing social realities and ends up claiming the inevitability of inequality. The environment is no more influential than the potential abilities the individual inherits at birth and the environment is no more easily modified. Man is a unified whole, body and mind, he shapes himself, starting with inherited materials, and through actual social relations and lived experiences, different for each person. Kriegel is right in criticizing those who hold that anti-racism implies impugning the concept of hereditary behavior. In this regard, He shares the viewpoint of all those who argue systematically in terms of interaction or coevolution. Aaron has written that intellectual skills are conditioned, not determined, by the genetic patrimony. Today, it is commonly held that heredity determines, not culture, but the ability to acquire culture. Levi Strauss has reversed the equation, claiming that race is a function of culture, each culture selects genetic aptitudes which, by retroactive effect, influence the culture which had first contributed to their development. The result is that human evolution is not a byproduct of biological evolution, nor is it completely distinct from it, so that collaboration becomes possible between racial and cultural studies. There remains the task of examining a last attempt at redefining racism by improperly and excessively broadening the term. This is Tagif's work which has skillfully set about establishing the parameters of what he calls racism differentialist, or racism identitaire. By this designation, Tegif describes discourse which proceeds by focusing on the theme of difference and identity, with emphasis on the essential role of difference. Through semantic maneuvering, difference is established as an absolute, a close totality. It is claimed that this racism differentialist differs from inegalitarian racism from ordinary racism, just as difference of nature differs from difference of degree. This form of racism does not make negative value judgments about other races. Rather, it is essentially heterophile. Thus, it is depicted as a racism which masquerades as intelligent anti-racism. This masking of its true nature is not easily understood, because it uses a vocabulary which suggests neither rejection nor denigration. Therefore, it manages to put classical anti-racism on the spot since it is then supposed to undertake its own agiornamento and subsequently to abandon its defense of difference.
At this point, heterophilia and heterophobia meet in a zone of almost total equivocation. Impelled, not by a fear of equalizing everything and everyone, but by a dread of any melange, differential racism is considered worse in some respect than an egalitarian racism, because by treating races as entities that cannot really understand each other, it implies the impossibility of communicating between cultures and, inevitably, the acceptance of forms of apartheid. Methodologically, one may wonder to what an extent the reading in differentialist discourse is not based solely on the reader's intention. Here the emphasis is on ruses, camouflages, and other strategies of diversion, of euphemisms, or of semantic substitution, all of which are used and abused by this discourse. These are processes which allegedly are hardly noticeable to the uninitiated and thus demand a close critical textual reading. In short, such a reading demands the skills of those who know how to read between the lines. All of this inevitably leads one to question the validity of the entire process. Differentialist discourse, properly understood, demands attentive critical reading, because it is supposed to mean something other than it actually seems to claim. The intended audience of the message is presumed to be able to decode the message without being misled by the previously discussed strategies. But does this not risk falling into circular reasoning such as, the proof that they are racist is that they maintain that they are not racist, the approach of confirmation by denial? Because such reasoning is present in the analyst's mind, does it follow that the same thoughts are really those of the person whose discourse is being analyzed? As Tegif has pointed out, this theory of a differentialist racism raises a fundamental objection, the very concept of difference as an absolute is a contradiction. To posit difference implies the possibility of comparing commensurable entities. One can only differ in relation to another, perceived as different. A difference established as an absolute is no longer a difference. The contradiction is evident, either difference is not absolute, in which case differential racism falls apart, or difference is an absolute, in which case there is no longer any real difference, nor any differential discourse. As for apartheid, it is too easily forgotten that what characterized it was not a separation willed by one party or the other, but a separation imposed and accompanied by domination. Finally, the hypothesis of a differential racism has the disadvantage of putting anti-racism in a bind. If racism can be considered as either heterophile, or rachophile, or as heterophobic, or rachophobic, then the very definition of anti-racism becomes problematic. As Tegif puts it, it is caught between the contradictory imperatives of fighting, at one and the same time, against phobia of the other, and against an excessive apology on behalf of difference. The anti-racist must walk a narrow path that bears all the appearances of a double bind. Then what should the anti-racist advocate? Silence? Indifference? The elimination of collective identities, but that would not seem to respect the other? Tagif proposes a universalism without the proposal of a single model. That however, seems akin to proposing a square circle. There are certainly ways of speaking about differences, which turn difference into a fundamental obstacle to all communication. Similarly, discourse can be used for strategic purposes and serve intentions other than those explicitly expressed. But that is true for all discourse, and the discourse of suspicion can itself become suspect. On the other hand, when the right to difference is clearly presented as a right, of peoples to maintain their identities, and is not seen as an obligation imposed, by whom? In whose name? When difference is also presented as what it is, and not as an absolute, in which case it would cease to be a difference, when the principle of difference is vigorously defended to the benefit of all groups, and not only to the advantage of some, when, moreover, difference is not based on biological, ethnic, or racial data, then one fails to understand how so-called differentialist discourse could be considered racist, unless, of course, one considers racism as the source for a drive so general, so universal, as the desire of whole groups to perpetuate themselves in the future without loss of their past identity. In truth, it is the diversity of the human race which creates its richness just as it is diversity which makes communication possible and gives it value. Diversity of peoples and cultures exist, however, only because, in the past, 
these various peoples and cultures were relatively isolated from one another. According to Levi Strauss, one cannot both uphold diversity and be unaware of the fact that this diversity results, in large part, from the desire of each culture to be different from all those peoples nearby, to distinguish themselves from them, and, in short, to be themselves. It follows that total transparency in human relations would lead to the same result as total closure. In other words, communication can only be imperfect. Without this imperfection, it would lose its raison d'etre and its very possibility of existing. Again, Levi Strauss writes, one cannot, at one and the same time, lose oneself in the enjoyment of the other, identify with him, and maintain oneself as different. Total, integral communication compromises, in the short or the long term, both one's fundamental integrity and that of the other. The great creative epochs were those when communication had become sufficient so that various groups, though apart, stimulated each other, without the interaction being so frequent and easy that obstacles, which are indispensable between individuals, as they are between groups, dwindle to the point that interaction becomes so facile as to neutralize and nullify their diversity. The dialectic of self and other goes back to Plato's sophist. Following the example of many contemporary movements, one need only think of neo-feminism, anti-racism has fluctuated between respect for differences and egalitarianism. There is a racism which obsoletizes the other in order to create a totally other with whom no one can have anything in common. There is another, more perverse racism which obsoletizes the same and, in the name of same, challenges the very idea of difference. The other can then be denied twice. Either one destroys the other's very difference or, in a more subtle way, one denies that there is another. The approaches are different, but they come to the same results, the suppression of difference, whether by acting in such a way that difference no longer exists, or by acting as if difference never did exist. According to Unreal Faber, this is an age when the forces for homogeneity confront the powers opting for separation, and the struggle is titanic. In such an age, Anti-racism should struggle, head-on, with these two approaches. This implies learning the value of difference as the prerequisite for a dialogue respectful of each group's identity. It also implies understanding that it is not so much the perception of differences which provokes racism, as the feeling of the disintegration of identities, which then leads to recreating identities in pathological ways and from the perspective of racial xenophobia. It is time wrote Guy Michaud, to develop a strategy for interethnic and intercultural relations, based not only on respect and understanding, but on the reality of differences. This is also Ironos Ibleibsfeldt's view, one often hears the argument that only a single worldwide civilization, with a total mixture of all races, would resolve the tensions and conflicts between groups. That does not appear to me necessary or desirable. If one could teach man to be tolerant, that is, to be ready to understand and accept other lifestyles both within civilizations and between various peoples, then ethnocentrism will find itself diffused without it being necessary for groups to surrender their cultural uniqueness nor pride in their own civilization. Establishing peace among peoples need not be accomplished over the dead bodies of civilizations and races.